Hello, everyone. My name is Nisreen Sabha. I am the destination manager for Canada and the USA here at IDP and Uni Abroad. Uh, thank you for joining us for the uh, virtual Kenya Roadshow. Today, we'll be discussing uh, studying in Canada as an international student. Uh, we will introduce IDP and the student journey why more and more international students are going to Canada, why you should also consider Canada, the fall intake timeline, study levels across institutions in Canada, the application process and requirements, medicine, costs and scholarships, working while studying, study permit application, and uh, last but definitely not least, postgraduate opportunities. Now I'd like to introduce IDP Education. We are a global leader in international education services. Our success comes from connecting our students with the right course in the right institution and country relevant to their academic and career goals. We have been operating for more than 50 years now, creating a huge network of opportunity with offices in over 30 countries. We are proud to say that we are the co-owner of IELTS and operate 11 English lang language teaching campuses across Southeast Asia. And like mentioned, um, we are now partnered with Uni Abroad in Kenya uh, to assist Kenyan students who would like to study across our six destinations of Canada, Australia, UK, USA, New Zealand, and Ireland. The student journey with IDP Uni Abroad would involve a one-to-one -one counseling session whereby um, we would meet with you and uh, discuss your academic and career goals and then shortlist relevant institutions. Um, we would then assist you with uh, lodging the application, submitting your documents, receiving a decision, be it um, an offer letter or a rejection letter. Um, in the unlikely case that you do get rejected, we would continue to work with you to obtain an offer letter that you're absolutely happy with. At that point, um, we would further help you with lodging the uh, visa application and documents, securing accommodation, um, and there would also be pre-departure services whereby um, we would have a pre-departure seminar to advise you what to expect during your travels, during uh, the initial period of your studies when you arrive at your institution. Um, if you're interested in Australia, for example, we can even go further and that we can help you set up a bank account, secure your health insurance, um, have a SIM card, um, all, from the, uh, all from your home country. So, I also wanted to share a very uh, brief uh, clip about international students in Canada. This is Study BC, but a common theme that was in the video was community. Now, Canada is a relatively younger country, um, and they do care about community engagement, and they have such an open door policy right now for international students and for immigrants. Now, saying this, I wanted to also share a few fast facts and figures. Uh, the capital is Ottawa in Ontario. Uh, as of 2019, they have a population of 37.59 million. There are 642,000 international students and growing year on year. Uh, there are two official languages, English and French. Uh, there are three territories up north, as you can see in the map here, Yukon, Northwest, and Nunavut, and 10 provinces down south. Um, Ontario, British Columbia and Quebec tend to be the more popular. However, uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and the Atlantic provinces and whatnot are gaining um, popularity given their um, attractiveness in terms of post-study work opportunities in PR. Now, 
going back to um, why you should consider Canada and why more and more international students are doing so. Um, firstly, uh, they have such an affordable uh, tuition and cost of living uh, when compared to other study destinations such as the UK, USA, um, Australia, etc. Um, and this is not at the expense of the quality of education. So you are um, definitely receiving a top quality international uh, class education at an affordable uh, cost. On campus, there is something for everybody. There's engaging campus lifestyle in terms of clubs and societies. It's a safe and multicultural environment like we saw in the brief clip earlier. Community is so important uh, and they work really hard um, both in campus during your studies and post this um, to integrate uh, international students and immigrants. Um, saying this, there are co-op and research opportunities that are quite unique to Canada, uh, specifically at the undergraduate level. If you look at other destinations, you'll find that research is usually reserved for um, graduate level studies. Um, but in Canada, you would definitely be able to get your hands on research and internship or also known as co-op within Canada quite earlier on in your undergraduate studies. Um, now, in the same vein, um, local employers and industries coordinate closely with institutions to ensure that um, programs that are being offered at universities and colleges are in demand so that graduates are not looking for work for too long once they graduate, they will dive right into the job market and be able to secure work um, or continue into further studies. Um, saying this, there's also a very gener uh, generous postgraduate work permit allowance for, for international students. Now, this ranges anywhere between 8 to 12 months, and it is linked to the duration of your studies. So if you study on a program that is two years and more, then you would be um, eligible for the full three years in postgraduate work permits. Um, if you study in a program between eight to 12 months duration, then you would have an eight to 12 month uh, work permit. And then after the eight to three years, eight months to three years um, postgraduate work permit duration, you could eventually, if you're so interested and so inclined, uh, work towards PR. Now, over to the uh, admissions uh, for the fall intake timeline. Now, this timeline would also include shortlisting your institutions that you'd like to apply to, lodging your application, onwards towards visa, and traveling and joining your institution. Now, ideally, um, you should be looking to shortlist uh, your institutions that you'd like to apply to around October, begin lodging your applications mid to end of October into November. One thing to bear in mind is that the more highly ranked the institution, the more competitive the program, the earlier the deadline. And in general, it's always a good advice to apply sooner when you're applying to Canada rather than later due to its rising popularity, uh, more and more students are applying and um, institutions are reaching capacity faster um, and filling those seats. So it's always good to apply sooner as they may operate on a first come first serve basis. So going back to the timeline, this would mean for universities lodging the applications anywhere between October and January, for colleges between December and March, admissions is quite competitive, limited seats and, what's not, and whatnot. Um, in general, deadlines can close anywhere between November and March. You should expect to start receiving offers between March and May, and then lodging your visa application between June, um, and then having that visa um, in hand by first week to second week of August. Plan to travel from mid-August to the end of August in that period, and then arrive 
uh, the beginning of September. So the first week of September uh, in time for your orientation week and first day of classes. Orientation week is really important. Um, this would allow you to become familiar with the local area uh, for registration, to get to know where classes are going to be, accommodation and whatnot. Um, Canada has three intakes. The first and main intake would be fall beginning in September. And this is um, where you would find the full range of programs available and open and taking uh, applications. Um, the second intake would be spring or winter, which begins in January. This has much more limited um, options available and not all institutions will have uh, a January intake. So that's something to bear in mind. And then there's also a third intake, which begins in May, which is the summer term. Now, this is not always available similarly, uh, like the spring or winter intake. Um, it's even less so. Um, so again, it's always, it's always best to aim for the September intake because that's when you'll find um, the more competitive programs and the wider range of programs available to students. And something to bear in mind, again, it's really important that the complete admission process can take up to nine to 12 months. So this includes the research, the planning, applying for admission, confirming offers, taking any relevant tests that's required, um, securing your visa, traveling, beginning your studies. Now, there are different study levels in Canada that is quite unique to Canada saying that. So straight from high school or secondary education, um, you have the option of certificates and diplomas that vary from one to two years in duration. And these are technical programs, vocational job oriented programs that are there to get your job market ready quickly. Um, there are associate degrees, which essentially are transfer degrees. So you would study uh, two years at a college and then transfer to year three at a university and continue into year four, finally graduating. So your overall duration would be four years, except it would be split between two years at a college and two years at a university. Uh, they are called associate degrees or sometimes also referred to as transfer degrees because of that process. Uh, bachelor's degrees, of course, you have also an honors bachelor degree. Now, the difference here would be the uh, your cumulative GPA that you score towards the end of your studies. You would have that uh, additional honors designation. Uh, typically speaking, bachelor's duration is four years in Canada. Uh, in Quebec, you may find uh, bachelor's of three-year duration. Now, once you've completed a bachelor's program, you may be eligible to apply for, or you can be eligible to apply for postgraduate certificate and diplomas. And they're very similar to the first set of certificates and diplomas. The only difference here is that they require bachelors as a prerequisite for admission, but they are also, again, technical programs that are there uh, for you to cross or upskill um, yourself at that point of your career. Um, you do also have master's program that are split up by research or course based. And again, um, typically between one to two years in duration. Uh, after this, you'll have doctorate or PhD studies that will range from four to seven years. And then after this, there would be postdoc programs. Now, in terms of the application checklist, for undergraduate and postgraduate studies. There are, let's say, common requirements, and then there are additional or institution-specific requirements that will vary from institution to institution and then even program to program. So for example, um, you will always be required to submit your passport as a form of ID. For undergraduate students that are heading towards bachelor's studies, you would need to provide your high school transcripts from grade 10, 11, 12. So if you're currently studying in grade 12, you would provide your first semester and predicted grades. If you're doing 
um, external examination curriculum, then you would provide your predicted grades for those as well. And then once your final grades are released, you would submit them later. Uh, so initially you'd be um, awarded a conditional offer letter and then you'd be given a deadline to submit or to meet your conditions. Um, English proficiency scores, if you're looking at IELTS, it's between 6.5 to 7.0, uh, no band below 6.0. If you are a bachelor student applying for a master's program, again, you would still need to have your passport and English proficiency scores and your predicted grades, but instead of high school transcripts, you would provide your interim bachelor's results. So your, your interim bachelor's transcripts um, and a letter from the university to prove you're currently enrolled in your program of study. Um, a CV can assist uh, to highlight your work experience. If you're looking for research-based masters, it's a really good idea to reach out to the faculty for the program that you're looking to study and secure an advisor before you apply. And then as mentioned, some institutions may require um, two to three recommendation letters, uh, a statement of purpose, uh, portfolio if you're applying for design related majors. Now, there are prerequisite subjects that institutions expect high school students to have. So general prerequisites include uh, English, mathematics, a natural science, so for example, biology, chemistry, physics, so social sciences, and this is expected in the last uh, three to four years of your uh, high school studies. And then major specific prerequisites are also there. So for example, if you're looking to study architecture and engineering, you are required to have studied maths, physics, and chemistry. Um, if you're looking for a health-related major, you'd be required to have math, biology, chemistry. Um, if you're looking for business, you would also need maths, um, so no surprise there. It's actually quite a commonly asked question. Some students uh, following specific curriculum, uh, for example, if you're doing um, CBSE or if you're doing A-levels or curriculum that you can choose your subject. Sometimes students overlook maths thinking it's not a required subject but it's actually really important and it's always safe to include maths as a subject in your studies. Now, in terms of uh, applying, there is the OUAC or the Ontario Universities Application Center. Now, this is a centralized application for 20 participating Ontario universities. Um, there is a base fee of 156 Canadian dollars for your first three uh, university choices, and then you would pay 50 Canadian dollars per additional university. Deadlines vary according to the institution. So there is no one fixed deadline for all the universities. You'd have to be sure of the deadline for each institution that you'd like to apply to and ensure you submit that application by that deadline. Um, OUAC application opens mid-September, so it has opened already uh, for January semester and fall semester applications. There are nine sections that cover your personal information, your contact details, your academic background, so you'd report what curriculum you're studying, what school you've studied at. You would provide your program choices, so per university that you're applying to, you can apply for three majors or three programs. Um, you would also let them know if you have previously applied to that university. You would self-report your uh, academics. So if you have any test reports to provide uh, or test scores to provide, you would do that there. Um, provide your transcripts. Uh, give an overview of your activities, extracurriculars, employment, and so on. Review your application, submit, and pay for the fees. Um, we have been given uh, some feedback from our partner institutions to say that it's important that you accept 
or decline your offer on OUAC. Um, I also wanted to highlight that as an international student, you would be looking at the 105F application as um, you're not currently studying under an Ontario high school curriculum. Now, medicine is quite a common, commonly sought after uh, program of study. Something to bear in mind with uh, Canada and even the US at that, um, students are not able to just jump into first years of a Bachelor of Medicine program straight out of high school. Um, in the US and in Canada, they operate on a pre-professional and professional uh, schooling basis. So in this instance, you would study a complete bachelor program anywhere between three to four years in pre-med. So this would be ideally um, in a health related major such as biology, biochemistry, biotechnology, and so on. Um, you would complete the degree, you would apply for medical school uh, in your last year of your pre-med and you would go through interviews, sit for the MCAT exam, submit those scores, um, and you know, complete any other additional requirements. The duration of your studies would be the full pre-med, so let's say four years, and then four years medical school. So your studies would be eight years total, and then you would have to continue to sub uh, supplement this with your residency, training, uh, specializing, and so on. Um, and that can be at a minimum of eight years studies and upward of 12 years um, training and specializing. Uh, so it, it is essentially uh, the rest of your life. Um, but this aside, um, there is a lower admission rate for international students in Canada for a medical school to the extent that some medical schools just do not accept international students. So uh, please do bear this in mind. In this instance, I would suggest that you also research um, other destinations that ha do have a first year entry from high school, such as um, the UK, Australia, and to an extent, New Zealand. They will still be competitive, but then at least you would be able to um, apply for that admission straight out of, out of high school. Um, so circling back to the pre-professional and professional studies, pharmacy, veterinary medicine, law, and physical therapy are some examples of programs that follow a similar um, study route. Now, the admissions rate is much higher for pharmacy and law and physical therapy and so on. Um, so you wouldn't have to worry about necessarily a lower admission rate, but they do follow a pre-pharmacy followed by PharmD um, or pre-law followed by law school format. Now, moving on to the costs and scholarships, another frequently asked question and quite an important uh, topic to discuss. Average tuition can range on an annual basis between $12,000 to $35,000 Canadian. Again, this is averages. You may find lower and you may find higher depending on the institution. Um, also, it can vary from program to program within the same institution. Um, sometimes you'll find that engineering or more competitive business programs can be on the higher range of the tuition. As an example, uh, also living expenses will range between $8,000 to $15,000 Canadian. This will depend on the province, on the city or the location uh, within the province um, and the type of accommodation, if it's a shared room, if it's a single room, ensuite or or not, and then the type of meal plan and so on. So this can all vary. And again, I'd like to stress that these are averages. You may find less, you may find more, but we just wanted to give you a, a, a starting snapshot of what to, you know, from to range. Um, there are scholarships that are available to international students on a merit basis. So they will be looking at your academic performance and then a 
Beyond this, they may also be looking at your extracurriculars. There are two types of applications. So um, you may be awarded the scholarship automatically with your offer to, of admission. And then the second type would be uh, requiring a separate application exclusively for the scholarship, uh, potentially with a essay addressing a prompt and uh, possibly requiring you to apply earlier than regular admission deadline. The scholarship ranges between a uh, thousand Canadian dollars and ten thousand Canadian dollars. This is an average again, but this is usually what we see scholarships being granted per year. One thing to note that's really important is that um, full scholarships are not commonly offered by Canadian institutions. You may hear about you know an institution providing this, but it's not the common or the regular thing for Canadian universities or colleges to do. Again, most likely you would be um, awarded a scholarship between $1,000 to $10,000 Canadian per year. So while we're discussing finances, um, it's also important to consider your uh, work opportunities while you're studying. So as an international student, you're able to work 20 hours per week on or off campus, and um, you're not required to have a work permit for this. I thought it would be a good idea to highlight the hourly minimum wage by province, just to let you know what to expect uh, to earn from your part-time work. Now, Alberta tops the list of having the highest hourly minimum wage because they are a hub for petroleum and IT um, industries. And so coupled with a lower cost of living, um, they have quite an attractive hourly minimum wage. Next up in the list um, is Ontario and British Columbia. One thing to bear in mind though, this may kind of be offset by a higher cost of living in these two respective provinces. After this, you're looking at Prince Edward, Nova Scotia, Quebec, and so on. Um, you will see, you will note or find that these provinces are considerably uh, more affordable to live in as compared to Ontario or British Columbia. Um, moving on to co-op education. Co-op education is essentially a paid internship. It's full-time internship whereby um, it consists of three semesters and you would pause your studies and embark or begin the co-op um, for full-time duration during the semester. Although it is a three-semester duration, you are not you're not completing the co-op consecutively um, the three semesters. So for example, you would study for a semester and would be able to uh, go on to your co-op for a maximum of two semesters return back to your studies and then complete your last semester of co-op. Or, you know, you could do a study co-op, study co-op, and so on until you complete uh, the co the three semesters. Um, you wouldn't have to worry about this now in terms of planning that. There are co-op advisors on campus that will work very closely with you to ensure that uh, you meet the requirements. Uh, one of them being that it cannot comprise more than 50% of your degree. Um, and the position must be relevant to your major. Um, you would be required to have um, a work permit and they will also be able, the team on campus would also be able to help you add this to your study permit. Average salaries on co-op can range between 560 Canadian dollars to 1,160 per week. Again, these are averages. And the range here is because as you would with a normal um, career progression, with more experience, um, the higher your average salary will be. And this can also vary according to the major. So for example, if you're looking at, if you're studying engineering or let's say cybersecurity or actuarial sciences, um, you may find yourself on the higher end of the range. Something to bear in mind. Now, I also wanted to discuss 
the study permit application process. At this time, um, you would be submitting the application online. Traditionally speaking, pre-COVID, um, you would be able to submit either online or a paper application, but the paper application is currently not being accepted. So online is the way to go right now. Um, you would upload your documents, you would pay your fees online, and then you'd receive an invitation to submit your biometrics. Um, you would need to monitor your email or your application portal as you'll be notified of any document requests or any kind of decision or updates uh, this way. And if successful, you would be submitting your passport to add the temporary resident visa, which is the screenshot of the first half. So essentially, this would be the visa that is stamped onto your passport. And this would allow you to legally enter Canada as an international student. Um, on the lower half of the screen, that screenshot is the actual study permit. Now, this study permit you will pick up not from the embassy. It's not going to be provided in Kenya. You would be provided the study permit, uh, this letter, um, at the border at the airport by the immigration officer. But I thought it would be a good idea to have um, an example for you to refer to. Now, the checklist... Uh, for the study permit application includes the 235 Canadian dollar application and biometrics fee that you would pay online. You would need to have your letter of acceptance from the institution. You would need to provide a letter of explanation or you know, also known as a study plan whereby you outline your motivation for studying in Canada at this specific institution you chose explain why you chose this major, um, explain your academic and career goals, how, uh, how would this improve your, um, your situation. Um, you would also need to demonstrate that you've done research into the institution, into the program itself, and that there are no alternatives or options in your home country. Um, so put together an A4, uh, one A4 page uh, it should not go beyond that. Uh, two white background visa photos, of course, your biometrics that you would submit. Uh, medical and financial documents are also really important. You would need to provide a bank statement uh, covering four months worth of maintenance. Um, and when I say four months worth of maintenance, that means that the balance of that bank statement should not fluctuate drastically within that four months, and this needs to evidence one year's tuition and at least 11,000 Canadian dollars as living um, maintenance or expenses. So essentially, for four months, you need to keep the amount of one year's worth of tuition and 11,000 Canadian dollars as living expenses and avoid as much as possible um, a single transfer into the account of a large amount or any sharp fluctuations uh, in that maintenance period of four months. It's good to provide a financial declaration by the student sponsor. So for example, if you are a student and your parents will fund your studies or if you're funding your child's studies, you could draft a financial declaration or affidavit to say that you acknowledge you are the sponsor, you pledge um, X amounts of funds for tuition and living purposes uh, for the duration of the studies, provide um, a link, you know, your relationship to uh, the students uh, and your contact details. Um, if you have been granted a scholarship or if the student has been granted a scholarship, proof of this would be good to provide as well and receipts of any tuition or deposits paid to the institution. Um, in addition, above this, um, any proof of property titles, business uh, salary certificate, et cetera, can also strengthen your application. Now, um, in this new uh, COVID-19 related uh, world, there has been a new, a relatively newer 
uh, study permit process, study permit application process, which is the two-step uh, permit process. The first step would involve submitting your application like you normally would do online, and you would receive an acknowledgement that you have met the um, minimum eligibility for the study permit. Um, this would be necessary for select institutions that previously, earlier on in the pandemic, were requiring a study permit for students to begin with online studies. Um, this would also be pending documents. If you had any pending documents, this would allow the opportunity for you to submit this. Um, there was a stipulated deadline. However, this has been extended. Now saying this, if you're granted in this scenario an AIP, this does not guarantee that you will be approved the final study permit. You would still be pending the final decision of uh, rejection or approval. But the trend that we're noticing is that if you are granted an AIP, you are more likely to be approved for the study permit. Um, on the right side of this uh, slide is an example of an AIP letter. So it doesn't actually mention on the letter itself AIP or approval in principle, but this is essentially what this will look like. And in the notification, it will advise you that uh, you have been approved uh, for this initial, that you meet the eligibility requirements in this two-stage process and that you should um, begin to prepare for your online studies if you're planning to do so, um, and that they will be in contact for any additional requirements as necessary. Now, past this, um, postgraduate opportunities is a strong motivation for international students across uh, the globe to consider Canada and they have quite um, generous allowances for international students in place. Um, so the postgraduate work permit, PGWP for short, um, is the eight month to three year post-study work um, eligibility uh, for international students. And like I mentioned, this is commensurate according to the duration of your studies. Um, students have 180 days from completing their degree to apply for the postgraduate work permit, both uh, inside Canada or if they've chosen to return home, they can do that as well from their home country. And it allows, of course, international students to stay back for that duration of eight months to three years and gain valuable work experience, which will not only, you know, contribute to their professional career, but also in the longer run as an international student, if you're interested in permanent residency in Canada, this can, this will definitely add points to your residency application, which is also known as express entry. Now, express entry is the application process for skilled workers um, for permanent residency. It, takes into account a range of factors, which include uh, education. So the number of um, programs that you've studied in Canada, the duration of these programs, your skills, your work experience in Canada, your language ability, your marital status, and so on. Um, you, you can check your eligibility online, prepare your documentation, submit your profile, and you would be invited uh, to apply. Now, in support of express entry, there is something called the Provincial Nominee Program, PNP for short. Um, and essentially, you would be nominated by the province you intend to live in and uh, settle down in. This would require medical exam and police check. You would be uh, contacting the province or territory requesting a nomination under a specific stream. So be it student, skilled worker, business, uh, semi-skilled worker, et cetera. Um, and this, again, like mentioned, would support your application for your uh, express entry or PR. Now, um, I also wanted to take this time to provide an update um, in terms of the travel restriction to Canada. 
uh, within the last uh, week or so. Uh, there has been updates to say that international students will now be able to enter Canada with a valid study permit, um, so long as their institution has met the uh, COVID readiness plan or response plan. Um, institutions are now coming out, um, providing updates if they have been approved or not. You would also be able to check on the IRCC website, uh, so the official government of Canada's website, uh, to check if your institution has been listed on their website as an approved institution uh, for their COVID readiness or response plan. Um, of course, your institution would let you know um, they have each been uh, sending out these updates um, as a matter of urgency, and um, that is the latest update. So going forward, um, students are still able to continue their studies online if they so choose, but saying this, if you have been granted a study permit, your institution has been approved uh, for their uh, response or readiness plan, uh, by all means, you would be able to uh, travel, but it's important that you confirm and you are absolutely 100% sure and have been given the go ahead um, by your institution. Um, and only then to make your travel arrangements and aim to travel and enter Canada, because if your institution has not been approved uh, for their readiness or response plan, then you would not be able to enter the country or to cross the border. So please do keep that in mind. But um, that is the latest uh, in terms of COVID related updates for Canada. Uh, so once again, thank you so much for joining us for our virtual roadshow. Uh, do stay up to date with us across our social media. Um, if you'd like, you can uh, take a screenshot of uh, this slide, we'll leave this up for you a little while longer. Um, we are on Facebook, on Instagram and Twitter. Um, so stay safe and thank you.